you see yourself is really, really important. It's not just an optional extra, oh, you know, oh, I think I'm a real loser, but God loves me. No, you've got to see yourself the way God sees you. Because if you're going to love your neighbor as yourself and you don't love yourself, guess what? You're not going to love them. Have you ever been to a fun fair and seen those distorted mirrors? Now, I had a bit of fun with this. Um, you'll see it come up on the screen here. Um, this is actually an app on my phone, believe it or not. I'd recommend it if you want to look very pretty. Um, so this is me, uh, a number of guises of me, shall we say. But, you know, you get those, fun, those, those mirrors in, in the fun fair that's kind of all distorted, and you look like that. And I like this one here in particular, the little pinhead one. Um, but they twist and distort how you actually... I don't actually look like that. I just want to point that out. No, no, I don't. <coughs> Even on a bad day, I don't look like that. But they actually twist and distort how you look, how you see. It doesn't change reality, but it changes how you see yourself. And this, you might, you might laugh about it now, laugh at my expense, but the thing is, that's how we see ourselves every day, through a distorted mirror. I don't often look in the mirror. It reflects badly on me. But I heard about a wife who was uh, looking in the mirror and she was very upset with what she saw. <coughs> and she said to her husband, look at me. Look, I'm getting older. I'm getting bigger. My face has more lines. My hair is grayer and it upsets me. And I desperately, desperately need a compliment. And the husband said, well, your eyesight's pretty near perfect. <laughs> Do not say that, men. Don't say that. You hear me, Alex? Alex? New, new husband, not a good thing to say, just saying. But look, how we see ourselves has incredible implications for how we live our lives. Do you see yourself as blessed or cursed? Do you see yourself as living under law, under grace? Do you see yourself as a person of value or a person who is worthless and not of value? Perception is everything when it comes to living your life. How you see yourself is going to affect how you live your life. So, to quote a famous lady... Let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. Psalm 139, if you've got your Bible, open it to there, because this is David writing, and this is why we started Lily House and why we care about um, girls having babies, why we want to bring them up well, because we want to save children, because we believe that life starts at conception. And that's our firm conviction. That's why we do the things we do. So Psalm 139, verse 13, David writes this, for you formed my innerward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. God is saying that you, when you were in the womb, he had a plan for you. When you were born, he had a plan for you. But before then even, when you were conceived, he had a plan for you. And he knows the number of your days it, when, when not even one of them has taken place yet. How amazing is that? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has a plan for you. You're not an accident. You're not an imposition. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God didn't make a mistake. God didn't get up there and say, I'm having an off day today. I think I'll make this person. And, oh, yeah, I, I wasn't really on song. To, God doesn't have off days. So he doesn't make mistakes. He created you with a purpose and a destiny, and he sees what we call intrinsic value even if you don't. <coughs> if I get a $50 bill and I wave it around up here, apart from some of you wanting to come up and take it, um, you would see the $50 bill. How much is a $50 bill worth in our society? $50. So if I stamp on it, how much is it worth? $50. If I chew it up and spit it out, how much is it worth? $50. If it gets dirty, if it gets soiled, if, 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 you, if you stick it in mud and pull it out again, how much is it worth? $50. You see, its worth is not in the condition that it's in, its intrinsic worth is in the value that is placed upon it by our government. And so it doesn't matter what condition you're in, God sees you as worthwhile and valuable because that's your intrinsic worth. That's what you are worth. Whether you are soiled, whether you're in sin, whether you are struggling, whether you're on top, he doesn't care. You still have value to him. You are precious to him. 
It's an intrinsic value, not dependent on what happens to you. So let's talk about these distorted mirrors. What distortions are affecting your view of yourself? Now, I thought of seven. There's probably many more. But I want to describe seven distortions that are used by the devil to affect how we live our lives. Proverbs 27 verse 19 says, As in water face reflects face, so the heart of man reflects the man. So if, if you've got water and, and, and it's dirty or gets choppy or polluted, it affects the image that's coming off the water. And if your heart is dirty or distorted or polluted, it will affect the clear image that you have. It won't be clear anymore, the value that God places in you. So let's have a look at some of the distortions that affect how we see ourselves today. Number one, our past. Our past affects our perception. The parents we've had, the siblings we had, the place we grew up in, all of these affect how we see ourselves. You may have grown up in a, in a family full of fear or domestic violence or divorce. Your parents may have told you that you're a disappointment or a failure or maybe they rejected you. Uh, you, might have been, you might have been bullied at school. I was bullied at school. Maybe that was you and that affects how you see yourself. Maybe you failed to achieve what you wanted to do in life. Our past experience affects how we see ourselves. But the Bible says, Isaiah 43, God says this, Remember not the former things. Do not consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. The Bible says when you come to Christ, you're a new creation. We don't, we don't take your old, sinful, messed up life and try and make it better. You're a new creation. It dies you live. The new you lives. That's what baptism represents. You go under the water, you die, you come out. It's the new you. So don't try and revamp the old one. When someone dies, you don't prop him up in a corner and have dinner with him every night and pretend he's still alive. That would be weird. What do you do when someone dies? You bury their body and you, you get to start afresh in the Christian life born again so we get a whole new life it's not the old one revamped so today is the day you need to start dismantling the mirror and letting god shape god shape your perception and your future as he desires he is promising a new thing not an old thing redone a new thing is that exciting it's an incredible way to live so that's the first thing our past secondly and this is an interesting one our curses many of us have had negative words spoken over us, particularly by people being angry at us. They say things, and sometimes those words stick. They stick in our head. Uh, the old saying was, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. That's a lie. Words will crush you and destroy your life way more than sticks and stones will. It could destroy your life for decades, words spoken over you. Words have power. Psalm 109 verse 2, David writes this, Wicked and deceitful mouths are open against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. Have you ever been, ever been attacked and you didn't even do anything and someone's attacked you? Has that ever happened to you? If it hasn't, become a pastor. You'll get used to it. Because everybody has an opinion. We live in a world where everybody has an opinion. You get on Facebook and say black is white and someone will have an opinion. It doesn't matter. Everybody feels they can air their opinion today and we hurt one another with the words we say and write and we don't even realize it. Words spoken over you can have a devastating effect even for decades. I remember praying with a, a guy who was in his 70s and his life was still being affected by words his father spoke to him at age five. And uh, as we were praying, we were, God gave me a vision of a, of a tree Outside of, outside of a veranda and as a little boy he was sitting under the tree he said that was exactly the front of my house and that's exactly the place where my father said these things to me you see how God weaves it all together but I mean that's you know words spoken by his dad 70 years ago are still affecting him today and how he sees himself there's a story in the Jewish Talmud about a king who sent two jesters on an errand so he said to the first one Foolish Simon, go and bring me back the best thing in the world. And then he said to Silly John, go, go and get me the worst thing in the world. And he sent them out. Well, pretty soon they came back, both grinning, 
like jesters kind of do. And um, he said, okay, he said, well, Simon, what have you got? He said, behold, Simon, the best thing in the world. He opened up a box and inside was a tongue. Just a tongue. That's weird, isn't it? But then John said, he said, what, what have you got? What's the worst thing in the world? John opened up a little bundle. Inside was a tongue. Because what it's saying is the tongue is both the best thing and the worst thing in the world. How many of you know you've used your tongue for good and for evil, yeah? Proverbs puts it this way, Proverbs 18. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. When you speak, what sort of fruit are other people eating? Is it good fruit or is it bad? Because you control that. Don't blame God. James has a whole chapter on how this tiny little piece of our body called the tongue seems to create huge fires and devastation. With the same tongue, we praise God and we curse men. We've got to watch our words. And even, even beyond that, even what our forebears have done can inadvertently be passed on to us without our knowledge. We call it these days a generational curse. But it can open the door to demonic activity in your life and it wasn't even your fault. No one's saying it's your fault, but sometimes our parents or their parents <coughs> have been involved in stuff that just seems to flow through and stick to us. Now, we see this all the time. I mean, Jeremiah, this has been around for... for millennia. Jeremiah wrote this in Jeremiah 31. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. See what he's saying? Things the father's done have repercussions down the line. God put it this way in Deuteronomy 5. I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. That's not a pronouncement of judgment so much. It's, it's just a pronouncement of consequences. It's just what life is like. And we see it all the time, even in our society. I, I know, you know, in our work in Lily House, we see like a, a, a single mum of 16 has a baby and then that baby has, has, has a child of 16 and then that baby has a child and it just goes down the line. It's a generational thing. A generation can be burdened by the sins of their elders. But I have great news for you this morning. You don't have to be burdened by that. We can break those curses. Those curses can be broken. Curses spoken over you directly and curses that have come down through the generations. Both can be broken. Our inner healing team do this every single day. They pray with people and curses are broken off them like that. And people are set free. God does not want you to grapple with undeserved words or demonic curses anymore, yours or your forebears. And here's a great verse. I love this verse. Proverbs 26, verse 2. Listen to this. Like a sparrow in its flitting, like a swallow in its flying, a curse that is causeless does not alight. If you are innocent, words spoken over you don't alight. They flit around and they can't find anywhere to, 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 to alight, and so they have to fly off. We can break the power of curses. We can break the You don't have to bear what you, what's been said over your life or what, what your forebears have done before you, we can break that power. The third thing that affects our perception of ourselves is our surroundings. Our circumstances can affect how we see ourselves. <laughs> Are we rich or poor, successful or not? Are our friends building into our character or leading us into disaster? Where we live, what, what we do for work, who we interact with, these can all change our perception. Now, I really like this floor because everyone used to run along this floor and they had a problem with people running along. So they painted it like that. And now no one runs along that floor. Now, the floor is just straight. That's actually a straight floor. But look at what they've done. They've messed with your head. They've used external things to change the way you see it. And that's what these mirrors do. They use external things that can change how we see reality. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. So listen, if your friends are leading you into sin, get new friends. Get godly friends. If your job is controlling and ruining your home life, get a new job. Yo, oh, but we need the money. We'd, I know money's important, kind of, but nothing is more important than your relationship with the Lord and with those around you. You know, if it takes you having to give up a job and get a new job or give up a friend or two 
do it because the most important thing is that your, your, your clarity of vision of yourself is not going to be wrecked by this stuff. If your surroundings are adversely affecting your view of yourself, change them. Pray and ask God before they ruin you and everything you hold dear. And listen, we go like the company we keep. We really do. So have a good look at who you, whose company you're keeping. The fourth thing that ruins our um, or distorts our vision is unfulfilled expectations, ours or somebody else's. It's a tremendous distorter of truth. Expectations of your parents, for example, can scar you for life. Expectations of your spouse or workplace can cripple you. Your own expectations, if you think I should be doing better and you don't make it, you can be crushed and destroyed. Uh, Psalm 34 verse 18, God says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. So if you're crushed today because you had expectations or someone else had expectations of you, we can, we can change that situation. If you're a victim of failed expectations, yours or someone else's, then today you can be set free. This distorted mirror needs to be destroyed and you can be healed. There's things in life you are not meant to carry. Some things you have to carry. Some things you do not. And our past and all of these things and failed expectations, they're things we don't have to carry. Number five is our sin. Our sin, whether it is in the past or whether it's happening right now, we're hiding it, it will poison how you see yourself and others. Sin has consequences. And now listen to this. This is important. You can choose your sin, but you can't choose the consequences. I'll say it again. You can choose your sin. You can sin if you like. That's your choice. But you cannot choose the consequences of your sin. They choose you when you choose the sin. James 1 verse 15. James writes this. When desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. If you are knowingly in sin or have sin in your past that you've never dealt with, it will affect your life. But the good news is, and this is great news. This is the gospel. 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to purify us from all unrighteousness. So today is the day you can be set free from the curse of sin in your life. It takes a simple decision. Lord, I yield this to you. And you can be set free from the power that it has on your life. Sometimes we have persistent sins. Ones that we don't tell people about, but we just find ourselves falling into the same trap every time you everything you try to do you you try to break it you try to break you can't break it i'm telling you god can break those things he can set you free from that stuff number six is our fears another mirror we often look at is our fears fear will distort your perception of you the lord everybody around you maybe fear of loss fear of failure fear of lack every fear you entertain distorts the image that god wants of you That's why Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. If you've got a spirit of fear, it's not from God. The Bible says fear God. That's a different fear. That's a respect. That's a holiness. that's That's an obedience thing. But if you are suffering with fear, I'm telling you now, it's not God. He doesn't give us a spirit of fear. It's what the Bible says. Last week I said, fear knocked at the door, faith answered, there was no one there. I love that. That's really cool. And I know so many people that are completely paralyzed by fear. They can barely function, even in church. But whatever fear you face, I declare to you that God is bigger than your fear. We live in a world where they dish fear out en masse. Didn't anybody scratch their head and wonder how we were fearful about this, fearful about that, blah, 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 blah. and then at one point, along comes COVID. Well, everybody's fearful of COVID. You know, you're all going to die and all this sort of stuff. I had somebody actually say to me that if I didn't make everybody in this church wear masks, all of us were going to die and it would be my fault. I'm serious. I actually had someone say that to me. So fear, 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 fear. So much fear. And then I remember when COVID was dropping off the map and they needed something to keep us fearful about, in one week it disappeared, was replaced by our floods, which lasted about a week because we, people were fearful of that. And then the Ukraine war started. Now we're all fearful about war. Now we're fearful about the Israeli war. 
And climate change, let's just be fearful about that. We're fearful about everything. You see, the, the, the government, the media, they push fear on people. People are living in fear constantly. I, see, I still today see people driving around in their own car wearing a mask. What the? Why, who are you going to infect? Yourself. I'm going to infect the gear stick. You know, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It's all fear. It's all fear. David writes this in Psalm 56. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? What can they do to you? They can kill your body. Who cares? I'm living forever. You know, we must not be controlled. We must not be distorted by fear. God said, Isaiah 41, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He is on our side. He is in our corner. We have nothing to fear. We've got to smash that mirror right now. Yeah. Come to Christ and you never need to look in that mirror again. Never. The seventh one is our feelings. We live in a society completely controlled by feelings. Feelings. Nothing more than feelings. Movies, songs, TV shows, internet sites, books, conversation, they all affect how we feel. <coughs> and how we feel affects how we view others. You know, pause for a minute. Have a look at ourselves. Look at our society. We have more than any other generation in history. We can communicate. You can pick up a phone and communicate with someone on the other side of the world. Never happened in history before. We've got so much technology. All the goodness that we've got. We've got food. We've got shelter. We've got all this wonderful stuff here. And yet this is the most depressed generation in the history of the world. They're prescribing antidepressants more than ever before in the history of the world. Why? Because stuff doesn't give us satisfaction. I hate to say, but Mick Jagger was right. He can't get no. He can't get no. You know, so... This is the thing. We've got all this stuff happening around. It's because we live out of our feelings, how we feel. It's, it's a classic mistake, how we feel, you know. You might look at me and think, well, Pastor Darren, you're okay. You're doing great. You've got a successful life and family and all that sort of stuff. But Fiona will tell you. She will attest that there are days I get up, frankly, I just want to scream and run. There are days when I feel so down that I think I'm an utter failure. And there are days when, I don't know if you're like this, but this is me sometimes. I, sometimes I just want to get up. I just want to curl up with chocolate and watch Netflix. Amen. Yeah. You see, our feelings distort, distort reality. They distort our perception. Listen, how you feel does not determine reality. Reality is completely independent of how you feel. We are given a heart to have feelings, but we are also given a head to have wisdom. And they should balance out. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We can't figure out our heart. Our heart rules us at times. Proverbs 28 verse 26, Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. So don't live your life solely by your feelings. That's a mirror you cannot afford to keep looking into. If you are struggling with the roller coaster of depression, you may need to get professional help. You know, if your brain's function is impaired chemically, you may need medication. There's nothing wrong with that. But you may also need counseling or deep spirit led prayer. I find my down feelings control me. And after a while, you get to know yourself and your hang ups a little bit more. But when, sometimes I feel overwhelmed by just the amount of stuff around. The last few weeks has been a bit like that for me. But I find when I get overwhelmed or when I'm exhausted is when I will feel the most down. And I've got to get up in the morning and say, you know, despite how I feel, God is still God. I am still his child. And, and I must not let the, the mirror of my feelings distort what I perceive as reality. And sometimes the most spiritual thing to do is to just take a break. Sometimes the most spiritual thing to do is to just sit down and relax. I, I sat down and had my quiet time yesterday and I saw something I have not seen for a long time. I was amazed. It's called the sun. And I sat there and I went, 
there's still a sun up there. I had, I've forgotten what it looked like. If you don't live on the coast, those of you online, you won't get it. But it's been pretty, pretty wet here. But I looked up, I, I paused from my quiet time, I looked up and I just looked up, up at the clouds and the sky and a blue sky, I forgot the sky was blue, and, and the sun. And I went, wow, you know, and I just spent some time praising God. And my soul rested. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is to take a rest. The old saying, come ye apart or come ye apart. If you don't, you will. Think about it. What happens is our feelings, what we're feeling, and the, the mirrors that we see ourselves with that distort us, what we do is we imprint those on our world around us. <coughs> we carry these mirrors with us. We gaze into them too often. And then we imprint the false image on top of the world we live in. And it changes how we see everything, ourselves, our lives, the Lord, people around us, everything. These mirrors imprint negative after images on our lives. Now have a look at this. I want to, want to get you to have a look at this. Just put it up on the screens here too. Everybody stare at a dot, one of those dots. Just stare at it. Don't look anywhere else. Just stare at it. Don't look to the right or to the left. Just stare, stare, stare at the same spot. Don't move your eyes. Just stare at it. Because in, in a few seconds I'm going to put up a white uh, a background, like right now. And now blink a few times, you'll see the English flag there in color. Am I right? How amazing is that? That's called a negative after image. You stare at it long enough, then when you look at something, you imprint it on that. Let's have a look at this one. This very, doesn't look like a beautiful girl there, but she's about to become more beautiful. Just stare at the dot in the middle of her nose. Just stare at it, stare at it, stare at it. Don't look in it. You, it doesn't work if you move your eyes. So just keep staring at it. And now we go to this. There she is. So this is called an after image. And it's a negative after image. We, we, we burn this image on our retinas and then we, we project it everywhere we go. And that's what your distorted view of yourself is like. If you have a distorted view, you imprint that on everything as you go along. It is time this morning, ladies and gentlemen, to smash a few mirrors. It's time that, that we took some of these mirrors and just knocked them out. Now, I promise you, if you smash these mirrors, you won't get seven years bad luck, but you will get set free. So I want to give you four things as we wrap it up here that will help you smash these distorted mirrors that are changing the way you see yourself. Okay, the first thing is, number one, be honest. 1 John 1 8 says, if we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If these perceptions, the way you see yourself is being distorted and it's controlling lives and behavior, they're sin and we should, if we ignore them or shove them under the carpet, they will continue to crush us. I used to um, sweep the kitchen floor with my kids. They will attest to this because I'm a very dutiful husband. And so we'd be sweeping. Well, but you get your little dust pan and you'd sweep the dust in the pan and it, it never all goes in, right? There's always a little bit left. And the kids will say, we can't get this up into the dust pan, this last little bit of dirt. What do we do with it? I said, it's easy. You just shove it under the fridge. So we did. So we just, we just put it under the fridge, put it under the fridge, put it under the fridge. That worked very well for some years. Then, of course, when we went to move, we moved the fridge and there is a pile of dirt under there like you would not believe. And Fiona says, how did all this dirt get here? And I'm going, oh, my <laughs> See, you can shove it under the carpet or under the fridge, but it ain't going anywhere. It's going to stick around. And some of you here, you deal with, you think you deal with stuff. And your response to, 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 to this stuff is you, you just shove it under the carpet. Oh, if I don't talk about it, it didn't happen. If I, don't, if I don't chat about it, we don't have to face it. You know, these words that someone said to me, oh, it's okay, it doesn't really hurt me. And you shove it under the carpet, but I'm telling you, it's still there and it will come out and bite you in the backside when you least expect it. It's not gone. It's just sitting under the fridge. It's time, ladies and gentlemen, I believe, to be honest. Not to ignore or shove things under the fridge, but to sort out this destructive stuff and set your life free from this sort of influence forever. If fear is controlling your life, don't put up with it. Get rid of it. If curses or words spoken of you seem to be changing the way you are doing it, 
don't put up with it, let's get rid of it. If expectations, if you've had expectations and you've fallen short, don't put up with the disappointment, let's get rid of it. It's time to clear the decks. It's time to get rid of the distorted mirrors. The second thing is, be obedient. Isaiah 6 verse 10, make the heart of this people dull, make their eyes heavy, blind their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. We can, we can look square at things and not see it. We really can. You can look at your life and say, oh, my life's pretty good, I'm doing all right, and not see the distorted mirrors that you constantly look into that will plague you, that will just sit there in the background and ruin your life quietly. It affects everything. It affects every aspect of your life if you don't deal with the distortions we've looked at today. So if you know your view of life is, is, and, and your worth is being distorted, don't harden your heart today. Turn to the Lord and be healed. It takes a choice to be obedient. But I've reached a point in my life where I'm just saying, Lord, I just want to be obedient to you. I, I'm prepared to let other stuff go. I just want to be obedient. John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Don't carry what God never intended for you to carry. Come to Jesus, all you who are wearied and burdened, and he will give you rest. I'm telling you, there are people here today that are carrying stuff. God doesn't want you to carry that. We live in a society so burdened with this stuff, so burdened with fear. God doesn't want you to carry that. It is so liberating to chuck this stuff up and smash a mirror up. Not seven years bad luck, you just get to be set free. The third thing, this is more practical, is be smart. The reality is in 21st century Australia, we are bombarded with all kinds of distortions, many of which find their way into our psyche. So my my strong advice to you is be smart what you put into your brain. Because we do, we, we put, there's such junk out there. And we keep, we keep visiting these websites or watching these TV shows or reading these books or whatever, and we put stuff in our mind that is actually distorting and destroying us. It's not building us up. That's crazy. Romans 12 verse 2, Do not conform any, any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind needs to be renewed. How do you do that? Philippians 4, eight. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything of excellence or worthy of praise, think about these things. Put the stuff in your head that is going to be positive, not ne- negative. Because it all affects us. We don't think it affects us, but we all, it all affects us. We're talking about feelings a little bit, uh, a little, a bit earlier. Fiona and I were away the other week and we went to see a movie called uh, Ordinary Angels. It's a, it's a tear-jerking movie, but it's a really, really good movie. I think it's actually, it's, it's a, it seems like a Christian movie anyway. It wasn't overtly Christian, but it seems like a Christian movie. It's about a little girl who's sick and, and she gets saved and all this sort of stuff. But we went to see it and I, I couldn't help myself. By the end of it, I was crying. Just quietly, I didn't let Fiona know, of course. I was, <laughs> you know, but, but see, things affect our emotions. But when we came out of that, that movie built us up. We talked about it for days because it built us up. That's something you can put in your, sp- in your soul, in your head, that builds you up. A lot of the stuff you usually put in your head doesn't build you up, tears you down. You know, and, and, and even, even watching the news. I don't watch the news because I'm sick of getting depressed and fearful, and down, and hopeless. I'd rather watch anything these days except the news. So monitor carefully and diligently what you let into your heart. Do not feed your heart junk. Guard it. Don't watch or listen to or swipe to TV shows or websites that distort your perception. Put pure godly things in your heart that build up your spirit. And the fourth thing. So we're looking at the four four areas here. Be honest, be obedient, be smart, and be courageous. Some of you are saying, yeah, I don't want to deal with this stuff because it's just too much. I get it. But if you take the first step, I guarantee you, guarantee you that God will meet you and he will take you on the journey of a lifetime. He will set you free from all this stuff we've talked about. 
He will set you free from the distortions in your mind, from the way you see yourself. But it takes courage. You can sit here stewing in your own malformed perceptions of yourself and nothing changes. You might even be content. I know some people who are miserable and happy to be. I know some people who can find a, a problem for every solution. And it doesn't matter what you do. Every time you talk to them, it's like, bam, I'm going to be negative about that. Right? That's, if that's your choice, that's your choice. But I'm telling you, God wants more than that for you. You can be courageous enough to take the first step now. Isaiah 30 verse 21 says, Your ears will hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or to the left. So you will hear behind you right now a word in your head saying, This is it. This can set you free. This can stop all of those things, that, all of the behaviors that you're doing that you don't even know why you're doing them. Some of it could be because you've got distorted views of yourself. And this is your moment to be set free from this stuff. If you hear that voice, be courageous enough to, to take the first step and say, You know what? Yes, Lord. I will pray with you. But, but often more is needed. We can help you to truly destroy these mirrors once and for all. Because Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, he said, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have life abundantly. And that's his destiny for you. If you're not experiencing an abundant life now, chances are your view of yourself is distorted. Don't sit around and accept it. I didn't appreciate how I looked in all those distorted images before. I didn't really like the way I looked there. I put them up as a bit of a joke. But I don't want to look like that. I really don't. Really, yeah. Some of you are surprised. I don't want to look like that. Right? Yeah, that's right. There you go. It was actually a Francois work. That's another story. Um, but, but I don't want to look like that. I want to look like what God wants me to be. I want to have the right perception. So today, if you know that your view of yourself and your life is being distorted, I want to give you the chance to be obedient and brave and let's start down the road and let's kick this thing out of the park. We have an inner healing team here who can work with you and I tell you, there are people being set free every single day. It's phenomenal. And that's God's destiny for you. You can say, oh, I don't want to do that. Oh, 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 it's just embarrassing to do that. I don't want to do that. No, take a step. Take a chance. I challenge you. Take a chance. Have courage. Step forward and say, you know what, Lord? I want to give it to you. I'm praying that you have breakthrough in your life and that, you, and, and that nothing holds you back. It's time to smash a few mirrors. It's time to fill our eyes with Jesus and imprint him instead of other stuff onto our circumstances. Look at the four dots in the middle. Put it up on the screen. Look at the four dots. Don't look anywhere else. Just look at those four dots. Don't move your eyes even a, a, a skerrick. Keep looking at those four dots because I want to make sure you get this image and you figure this out really well. Okay, when we go to a blank image, it looks like this. Blink a few times. You see him? Can you see him? Can you see Jesus? Right? We can imprint Jesus on our circumstances, not the junk that we're fed. We can imprint Jesus on our circumstances if we fill our minds with him because that's your destiny. That's your destiny. Would you bow your heads? It is time that we see ourselves as God sees us, that our vision is clear and not distorted. And I know God is speaking to many people here this morning and some of you are going, no, I... I don't, I'm not really prepared to do this, but you need to do this. this is, there are things in life you need to not be carrying. Some of you older ones, you've been walking with the Lord for a long while, but there's still things back there. We can set you free. God can set you free. Some of you younger ones, you're looking at yourself, you don't even know why you do some of the things you do, but I'm telling you, God can set you free from the fears from the expectations, from the past, from the curses that have been spoken over you, from the sin that's still in there, like believe God can set you free this morning. He can set you free. But He can't do it unless you come to Him. 
He can't do it unless you lift your eyes away from your circumstances and your past and all that other stuff and you put your eyes firmly on Jesus and you say, Lord, I'm going to imprint you on my world and live for you. So if you've never asked Jesus into your life, we're going to give you the opportunity right now. Some of you maybe have, but you're not sure. This is the time to be certain because this is life and death. This is what's going to control your life from here on in. If you're sick of living with fear, if you're sick of struggling with it, this is your moment. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Pray it with me and give your heart to Jesus. Just say this, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I turn away from my sin to you. And I ask you into my life as my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And help me to see my life the way you see me. If you pray that prayer for the first time, or maybe the first time in a long time, just shoot your hand up wherever you are, just so we can see. There may, are there any more? There may not be. That's fine. For the rest of us, we know the Lord, but we still grapple with this stuff. Salvation takes a moment, but sanctifi- sanctification takes a lifetime. And so I want to give you the opportunity to do some business with God. So I want to invite you, church, pray this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I choose to fix my eyes on you. I choose to see my life your way. And I choose to be obedient in smashing the mirrors that change my perception. Lord, you've heard the prayers of the saints here this morning. I pray, Father, that you would speak to us. Let's stand together. We're going to sing an old song. It's a good song, though. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth grow what?